Hi, my name is Scott Cruz and I'm an attorney at the law firm of Clark Hill. We are a full service law firm that has the resources and capabilities to handle any and all types of legal matters for any industry. My practice focuses exclusively on labor and employment law on behalf of employers. I specialize in providing legal advice designed to help my clients maintain peace in the workplace so they can focus on their business rather than litigation. Today we're going to discuss the Cook County Sick Leave Ordinance that was passed in October of 2016 and is scheduled to go into effect on July 1st, 2017. Just last week, on April 10th, 2017, the Cook County Commission on Human Rights issued draft regulations, and these regulations will govern the interpretation and enforcement of this ordinance come July 1st, 2017. So in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to go over the relevant issues that Cook, Cook County employers need to know about under the ordinance. And I'm going to use the regulations as guidance. So the first issue is what employers and employees are actually covered under this new ordinance? With respect to employers, it's any employer that employs at least one covered employee, and we'll go over what a covered employee is, and the employer must have its principal place of business within Cook County. Now one thing to note is that this ordinance does not apply to federal, state, and local governmental entities. What about employees? What employees are covered? Um, for employees, it's any individual who is paid to perform work for a covered employer. So it can't be an unpaid volunteer because that person must have actually been compensated for performing work. The employee must have worked a minimum of two hours in any two week pay period, and the employee must have performed work all within Cook County. Um, one thing to note as well is that the employee can be a full-time employee, it can be a part-time employee, a temporary employee, is a, or a seasonal employee, just must have worked two hours in any two week pay period. Now, not all employees are covered by this ordinance. Um, employees in the construction industry who are covered by CBA are exempt. Employees covered by a collective bargaining agreement that was entered into prior to July 1st, 2017 and it remains in effect after July 1st, 2017 are also exempt. Employees who have waived their rights under the ordinance in a collective bargaining agreement that was entered into after July 1st, 2017 are exempt. All federal and state employees are exempt, and all, in, all true independent contractors are exempt. Okay, the next question or issue I want to go into is, how much paid leave must be provided to employees, and when can employees use this paid leave? So employees begin accruing paid leave on the first calendar day after the start of their employment, or July 1st, 2017 whichever date is later. Employees are eligible to use earned sick leave when they have worked at least 80 hours for the employer within one, any 120 day period. So let's go over two examples that kind of reflect when an employee accrues and when an employee is eligible for the paid leave. Let's say an employee begins working on January 1st, 2017. So that's before the effective date of the ordinance and works 80 hours over the next 120 days. The employee's earned leave would start to accrue on July 1st, 2017. The reason, of course, is that July 1st, 2017 is the, the later of the two dates in terms of the day after the employee started, January 1st, 2017. Let's look at another example. Let's say an employee begins working on July 20th, 2017, so after the effective date, works at least 80 hours over the next 120 days. In this instance, the employee's earned leave would begin to accrue on July 21st, 2017. The reason is July 21st, 2017, that's the later of the two days. Again, either J July 1st, 2017, or the next day after the employee started, which is July 21st, 2017. So an employee accrues one hour of leave for every 40 hours worked. Now, what happens if an employee works less than 40 hours in a week? Because as I indicated before, this ordinance also applies to part-time employees. In that instance, an employer can award leave according to the employee's normal work week. 
So for example, if an employee works 10 hours per week, she will earn one hour of earned paid leave after four weeks of work. The reason being is, under the ordinance, an employee earns one hour for every 40 hours worked. So if that employee works 10 hours per week, after four weeks, it'll be 40 hours, and she will earn one hour after those four weeks. One thing to note is that sick leave or paid leave is earned only in hourly increments. You can't have fractional accruals. So the next issue I want to talk about is, are there caps on the amount of leave an employee can accrue? And can any leave be carried over to the following year? So under the ordinance, earned leave is capped at 40 hours for each 12-month period. Regarding carryover, employers must permit their employees to carry over half of their total unused accrued leave to the next 12-month period up to a maximum of 20 hours. Now, 20 hours is the minimum, but employers can set a higher accrual cap if they desire. And I see this a lot with PTO policies where employers will permit their employees to have unlimited PTO. One thing to keep in mind is under the ordinance, if you calculate the number of hours for unused sick time to be carried over, and that number happens to be a fraction, you're gonna round up to the next whole number. So let's go over some examples to illustrate what I've been talking about. So we have an employee of a non-FMLA employer, and that's a distinction that the ordinance makes in terms of an FMLA employer and a non-FMLA employer. And this employee has 20 hours of unused accrued earned paid leave at the end of their accrual period. She can carry over only 10 of those hours into the next accrual period. And how did I come to that number? Well, if you remember, I stated that an employer has to allow their employee to carry over half of any unused earned sick leave at the end of their accrual period. So half of 20 hours is 10. Now, let's say that same employee has nine hours of unused accrued earned paid leave at the end of the accrual period. She'll be able to carry over only five of those hours. And how did I come to the number five? Well, nine divided by two is 4.5. But if you remember, I indicated when you do that, if you, when you do the calculation and the number comes to be a fraction, you have to round up to the next whole number. So even though nine divided by two is 4.5, in this instance, that employee will be able to carry over five hours of, sick, of paid leave into the next accrual period. Let's say that same employee has 44 hours of unused accrued earned sick leave at the end of the accrual period. She can carry over 20 of those hours into the next accrual period. And how did I come to that number? Well, 44 divided by two is 22. But if you remember, I stated that an employee can only carry over a maximum of 20 hours. So that's why in this instance, even though 44 divided by two is 22, that individual will only be able to carry over 20 of those 44 hours into the next accrual period. All right, so the ordinance carves out a distinction for FMLA eligible employers. And if an employer is subject to the FMLA, this means they have 50 or more employees. For those employers, they must permit their employees to carry over half of their total unused accrued sick leave to the next 12-month period up to a maximum of 20 hours. But there's another caveat, and for FMLA-eligible employers, if their employees have unused sick leave that was not carried over, the employer must permit the employee to carry over up to 40 hours of that unused sick leave without dividing those hours in half. Now, let's look at some examples to illustrate what I just talked about. So, you have an employee of an FMLA eligible employer, and that employee has 30 hours of unused accrued earned sick leave at the end of their accrual period. Of those 30 hours, she can carry over 15, what I'm characterizing as ordinance restricted hours, and she'll be able to carry another 15, what I'm characterizing as FMLA restricted hours. How did I come to those two numbers? So 30 divided by two is 15. If you remember, I stated that an employee can carry over half of any unused paid leave they have available to them. So that's where that 15 comes. And why I'm characterizing it as ordinance restricted is that the employee can use these 15 hours for any reason. So for sick leave, 
for any other type of leave, even FMLA leave. Now, the employee can also carry over, as I stated, 15 FMLA restricted hours. The reason it's 15 is because the employee still has 15 hours of the 30 remaining. And because this is an FMLA employer, that employee can carry over 15 of those remaining hours into the next calendar period. Up to a maximum of 40, this employee only has 15 available to her. Now let's use that same employee, and this employee has 70 hours of unused accrued sick leave at the end of the accrual period. She can carry over 20, again what I'm characterizing as ordinance restricted hours, and another 40, what I'm characterizing as FMLA restricted hours. And how did I come to those two numbers? 70 divided by 2 is 35, but as we've been talking about, an employee can only carry a maximum of 20 hours over into the next 12 month period. So even though 70 divided by 2 is 35, of those 35 hours, only 20 get carried over into the next calendar period. Because there are 50 hours remaining of those 70, an employee can carry over 40 of those 50 hours. And why 40? Because that's the maximum number of hours that an employee can carry over for FMLA related purposes. So the employee can use those 40 hours, not for any reason, only for FMLA related reasons. All right, now what reasons, for what reasons can an employee use the paid leave? Under the regulations, employees can use paid leave only in the following circumstances. For an illness or injury of the employee or the employee's family member, including receiving medical care, treatment, diagnosis, or preventative medical care. The next reason is where the employee or the employee's family member is a victim of domestic violence or a sex offense. And the final reason is when the employee's place of business is closed due to a public health emergency or the employee needs to care for a child whose school or place of care is closed due to a public health emergency. Now, I use the term family member, and that's the term that's used in the ordinance. And how does the ordinance define family member? Well, it's pretty broadly defined. And under the ordinance, a family member is defined to include a child, a legal guardian, a ward, a spouse under the laws of any state, a domestic partner, a parent, a parent of a spouse or domestic partner, a sibling, a grandparent, a grandchild, any step in foster relationships, or any other individual related by blood or whose close association with the employee is the equivalent or a family relationship. Okay, the next issue I want to talk about is can the employer require an employee to provide notice when using sick leave? And under the regulation and the ordinance, what they say is if leave is foreseeable and the regulations indicate that a foreseeable leave is one for a court date or medical appointment, then the employee must provide at least seven days notice to their employer. Well, what about if the leave is not foreseeable? And under the regulations, they state that if the leave is unforeseeable, employees must provide as much notice as is practical. What about notice? Uh, what type of notice does the employee need to give the employer? Well, the regulations and ordinance state that notice can be provided by phone, by email, or even text message. However, the employer can instruct the employee if there's a particular manner or method in which they want notice to be made. But to do so, the employer must have a written policy, and that policy must indicate how notice is to be given. One other thing to keep in mind with regard to notice is Employers must post notices of employees' rights under the ordinance in a conspicuous location at each facility where any employees work within Cook County. And notice must be provided to all new employees at the time of hire after July 1st, 2017. So can an employer require an employee to provide a doctor's note if the employee is using the paid leave for, um, for a sickness, for a sick, sickness or other illness? And what the regulations state is that 
if the employee is using the leave for more than three consecutive days, and it's for sick leave purposes, then the employer can require that the employee provide certification that the leave was taken for a, the particular purpose provided under the ordinance. One thing to keep in mind is you as the employer cannot prohibit someone from using sick leave or even delay payment of wages um, for using sick leave just because the employee has not provided you with the required certification at the time of leave. So one, one question that I get a lot from my clients is, Scott, we already have a paid leave policy. Do we even need to follow this ordinance? And the answer, of course, is, well, it depends. And it depends on if your policy provides leave that meets or exceeds what is provided under the ordinance, then you are not required to provide any additional sick or paid leave in that sort of circumstance. I want to talk about some practical tips regarding these ordinance and what employers should be doing uh, prior to July 1st, 2017, which is when this ordinance goes into effect. Um, employers should review and revise their sick leave policies, their PTO policies, their family leave policies, and even their domestic violence leave policies to make sure those policies comply with the new leave law to the extent the employer is even covered by them. Uh, employers want to review their existing sick leave or PTO policies um, if they, particularly if they do not allow leave or care for a family member. And to that point, you want to make sure that the definition of family member in your policy matches the definition of a family member in the ordinance. Employers also want to consider revising any use it or lose it sick leave and PTO policies they may have to allow employees to carry over up to 20 or as many as 60 FMLA eligible hours of paid leave into any subsequent years. Um, you may also want to consider revising your leave policies that have a cap or place a maximum on the amount of sick leave or PTO that employees can accrue or accumulate each year to make sure that ALGE employees will, of course, once the ordinance goes into effect on July 1st, 2017, be able to accrue at least 40 hours of paid leave each year. You also want to, to the extent necessary, alter how sick leave or PTO is tracked and administered to make sure that eligible employees are allowed to accumulate, use, and carry over appropriate amounts of either 20 or, for FMLA purposes, 40 hours of paid sick leave in accordance with, in accordance with the ordinance. And as I indicated before, you also want to make sure that you're providing the notice of an employee's rights under the ordinance in conspicuous places and for any new employees that you hire after or on July 1st, 2017, make sure they are apprised of their rights under the ordinance as well. So the regulations that I talked about in the beginning, those are still in draft format. And what that means is that the Cook County Commission is allowing interested parties, so employers, or quite frankly anyone, to submit comments directly to the commission if they believe that something, if the regulations need to be amended or revised. Um, so if you go on the Cook County Commission on Human Rights website, you'll be able to find the regulations. Take a look at them read them. If you believe something needs to be amended, advised, revised, then comment directly to the commission. And you have until May 8th, 2017 to do so. So what's going to happen after May 8th is that on June 1st, 2017, there's going to be a public hearing. And at that public hearing, the commission will vote to adopt, reject, or amend its executive director's proposal regarding the regulations. And once they do so, we're going to have a final version of the regulations that will be in effect and that will guide the enforcement and interpretation of the, um, of the Cook County Ordinance. So I hope my presentation today has been informative. I know there's a lot of information uh, that I talked about. But if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my contact information is listed on the, the slide here. Telephone number is 
985-5910. Or if you'd like to email me, feel free to do so at scruz at clarkhill.com. Thank you and have a good day.